My name is Pastor Kanan. We're going to continue in God's Word in the Gospel of John. So go ahead and open in your copy of God's Word to the Gospel of John. If you don't have a Bible, uh, I will have all the verses on the screen. Chapter 1, verse 1. Finish chapter 1, chapter 1, verses 47 through 51. You've been in chapter 1 for several months, but it's a good chapter, and so it deserves it all. Uh, one of the, the greatest yearnings of the human heart, and this is true of all of us, one of our greatest yearnings of the human heart is the desire to be known. The relationship with friends or loved ones or perhaps then you know that being known carries a lot of weight in matter. Know you when your spouse knows you, when your kids know you. Even in the church context, it feels good when your your shepherds, your pastors know you. To be known is something that we're all yearning for. This is what I'm talking about when I talk about being known. To know someone is to have an enough relationship with someone under care and them without need of detailed instruction. I often talk I'm talking to individuals mean they want their significant other to know them deeply. To know is to have an intimate loving relational knowledge of someone. How many of you, don't raise your hand, but how many of you can resonate with the feeling of being known or feeling known? It, it feels good. You feel loved when somebody gets to know you. On our passage this morning, as Jesus is gathering more of his disciples, we get to watch Nathaniel's response to being known by Jesus. Then we get to see uh, Jesus' response to Nathaniel, that he will come to see greater things in and through the person of Christ. Let's rewind back to last week's text and then pick up on this week's text. This is from last Sunday. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. He found Philip and told him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the hometown of Andrew and Peter, whom we saw before that, gets, gets uh, snatched up by Jesus. Now we're watching Philip and Nathaniel. Verse 45. Philip found Nathaniel, and he told him, We have found the one that Moses wrote about in the law. And so did the prophets. Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathaniel responds, Good, come out of Nazareth. Philip says, Come and see. Picking up here, we were here this morning. Chapter 1, verse 47 says, Then Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said about him, Truly, hear truly. I want you to picture this in your mind's eye. Philip playing a mediator between, between Jesus and Nathanael, bringing them together. And Jesus, upon coming there, he sees Nathanael and he says, Truly, here is an Israelite whom there is no deceit. Jesus made two announcements. First, he said, truly, here truly is an Israelite. And the second thing he says is, in whom there is no deceit. Now, beloved, when we read our Bible, we tend to read over statements like this. But it's statements like this are pregnant with meaning that we miss because we read too quickly. This statement, he's saying a lot. In fact, this whole, this short little interaction between Nathaniel and Jesus is extraordinarily pregnant with meaning. To the naked eye, the statement doesn't look like it's much, but I think it meant more, and I think it means more. We're gonna see that it means more. And I think Nathaniel doesn't even understand the fullness of its meaning yet in their interactions. So let's put an ultrasound machine on the statement. Then Jesus saw Nathaniel coming to him and he said about him, here truly is an no deceit. I wanna talk about two things about this statement right here. One is for right now. The other one, I'm going to help you answer it. Then I want you to put it in your pocket. And then later on in the sermon, I'm going to tell you to take that out of your pocket because it's going to become very valuable as we move on. So the first one that we need to know now. One of the things Jesus is doing is making 
imperative statement between Nathaniel and the other Israelite leaders of the day. The leaders of Israel in Jesus' day were corrupt in nature, where Nathaniel's being person with no deceit. The Israelite leaders, now remember, if you're going to emulate anybody, who are you going to emulate but your leaders? And so he's saying you are truly an Israelite, and you're an Israelite with no deceit. You are different than the other Israelites, the leaders of the day, who are corrupt in many ways. They were power hungry. They were money hungry. They were hypocritical. They were selfish, and they cared only about self-preservation. Sound like today's politicians to you? <laughs> Isn't it true? Power hungry, money hungry, hypocritical, selfish, and all about self-preservation. Yeah, the scripture talks. I'm just saying, I'm just saying it's what it is. Like it, love it, or hate it. I don't care, but that's what it says. Now, Nathaniel seems to be opposite of these religious leaders. Nathaniel was a true Israelite in, in whom there is no deceit. There's no deception. There's no treachery. This word deceit, it means deceit. But let me give you the word picture. The word picture for that word, the word is actually bait. You guys know what bait is? Bait is when something looks like it's for your nourishment, but in fact, it's for your destruction, yeah. right? There's a, there's, a, there's a treachery involved. There's a trap involved. He says, in you, there's no deceit. You are, there's no hypocrite. There's no fake in you. This word literally means there's no bait. You are who you're saying you are and who you're presenting yourself to be. Nathan is a true Israelite, as all Israelites were supposed to be. So that's important. But that wasn't true of Israel at large. And here's the second thing that I'm going to need you to put in your pocket. I'm going to help you get there. Put it in your pocket until it's time to open it up. Two questions I'm gonna ask you, and I want audience participation. Cool? How did the people of Israel get their designation as Israelites? Say something. Born. Born. Come on, don't be sh I'll go say it's wrong. <laughs> huh? Where they lived? A okay, oh, we're getting warm. God gave it to him, yep. How? Who? Jacob? There we go, Jacob. Okay, here we go. We're getting, we're getting hot. Hot grease. The Israelites are descendants of Jacob, who's the son of Isaac. Yes, the son of God is true. Who's the son of Abraham, whom God chose and said, from you, all the nations will be blessed. So we have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Name means? Nope. Jacob's name means deceiver. God changes Jacob's name from deceiver to Israel. Everyone who comes from the loins of Jacob is considered an Israelite. They got their name because they're descendants of Israel, who was previously Jacob. Which Deceiver. That was the next question I got put it in there. What does Jacob mean? Deceiver. Israelites get their name from Jacob, which previously meant deceiver, but his name was changed by God. You got that? You understand what happened? Isn't that kind of, put that in your pocket. When we get to verse 50 and 51, it's gonna matter. But I think without getting to page to, to verse 50 and 51, he says, here's an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. See, the, the problem is we are not, we're, we're not Hebrew like that. We're very Gentile-ish, you and me. And so when we see words like this, we don't make... Jew in their time, hearing Jesus says that, all of a sudden their mind is like, shh, because all they're thinking about is their heritage. And they're like, wait a minute, in, an Israelite whom there's no deceit, my name comes from the And the they're making connections. But keep that in your pocket. Just put it, put it right there. We're going to pull it out in a minute. Verse 47. <laughs> then Jesus saw Nathaniel coming toward him, and he said, Here truly is an Nathan. I'm going to try to call him Nathaniel. That's his name. Look at what Nathaniel says. How do you know me? Why is he saying that? 
Philip met Jesus. He was convinced that Jesus was the Messiah. He went and got Nathaniel to meet Jesus. So why wouldn't Nathaniel automatically assume that Philip didn't fill Jesus in on who he was? You ever had a meetup where you're the mediator and you bring the two together and this will be get that phrase, I've heard so much about you, right? It's natural to, if, if, if I was meeting up with somebody through a mutual mediator and I went to talk to them and I shared something about them or they shared something about me, I'm automatically assuming they heard that from the mediator. Yeah. That's just natural. Oh, what, what you tell me? Yeah. I hope it's good. I hope it's true. <laughs> right? That's, that's the natural order of things. But we know that's not what happened because Nathaniel's caught off guard. How do you know me? Nathaniel wouldn't have said that if he had assumed that Philip had given him the information. Why? I think it's because Jesus' statement is revealing knowledge about Nathaniel that's deeper than what the human eye could see. Jesus is making a statement not about an external trait of Nathaniel, not about something that he heard about Nathaniel. Otherwise, he wouldn't have responded in that way. One time, um, I'm going to refrain from saying names. But there's a man that I know who's like a pastor of pastors. And uh, I got to do a cohort with this man. He kind of interviews everybody who gets into the conversation, asks me about my heritage and my background. And he, he stops and he says, your daddy wasn't in your picture, was he? Was he? And I lost him. Now, first of all, like, man, how do you know? That's not on my bio. That's not on my bio on the website. How did you know that about me? He spoke deeply to something that the normal eye could not see, but somehow God gave him lenses to see that I was hurting in a particular area of my heart, and I was covering it up because I don't want to hurt. You ever met somebody that looks you in the eye and can speak something, and you're like, man, I, man, what happened? What happened about that thing? And you're just like, how did you know? Their eye was able to penetrate deeper than what typical humanity was able to penetrate. I think there's a similar situation here where Jesus runs up on Nathaniel. He says, truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. He knows the heart of Nathaniel, where probably perhaps none of his friends could have said that or would have said that. Perhaps. In this question, Jesus proves his point that he was doing such things. Look how Jesus answers him. He says, how do you know me, Nathaniel asked? Before Philip called you, this is Jesus answers talking. Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Beloved, I don't know what Philip was doing under the fig tree. I don't know when Philip was under a fig tree. A lot of people want to say, well, maybe he's having a spiritual experience in the saw him there and be able to make that statement to the heart of Nathaniel because look at Nathaniel's response verse 49 Rabbi Nathaniel replied you are the son of God you are the king of Israel Nathaniel experienced being known by Jesus and up on him and one thing that I think we tend to forget in he knows you. God intimately knows you, first of all, because he made you. Look what the scripture said. Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down. And when I stand up. Now, beloved, of course, theologically, contextually, this is one person talking about their experience with God, but this is a universal truth because God is the creator of all people everywhere. As I stand up, I understand my. Uh, rest. You are aware of all my ways. Before a word was on my tongue, you know it all. Lord, it was, it was you who created me in my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Beloved, 
You want to be known? You're known off the sheer muscle that you are create, a creation of the Lord himself. He knows you. Not only does he know you because he's your creator, what you love and what you hate. He knows your insecurities and your struggles. He knows the true makeup of your character and he knows the true intentions of your heart. I'm not making any of that up. I love it. Look at the text. More. 1 Samuel 16, 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, I don't look at his appearance. The appearance of a stature. That's what we do though. We see the handsome, the fit, the beautiful. We make a joke. Saul looked like a king. He was majestic, a, a majestic looking man. And yet God says, I rejected him. Humans don't see what the Lord sees. But humans see what's visible. But the Lord sees the heart. Which means you can't put on before God. You can fool all of us. Can't fool him. There's more. And he told him, this is Luke 16, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the sight of others. But God knows your hearts. Now check this out. Oof, this is convicting for me. For what is highly admired before, by people is revolting in God's sight. Last one on this. For the word of God is living and effective sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrating as far as the separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Look at verse 13, beloved. No creature is hidden from him, but all things are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Beloved, you are already, your cup is already blown. Your cover is already blown before God. God's not impressed by what astounds the sheep. We tend to hide sin from God. One is we don't like to think of ourselves as sinners. Beloved, that's true of me and you. I hate knowing that about me, and I am a sinner. I don't want that designation. But two, this, there could be a list of 400 things, right? But here are just two things. I think that God might reject us if we admit to being a sinner. I say that God will reject us if we don't admit to being a sinner. God will reject us if we hide our sin from him. Look what the scripture says. If we say we have fellowship with him, and yet we walk in darkness, we are lying and not practicing truth. Walking in darkness is perpetual, living in perpetual, unrepentant sin. That's where the concept of practicing comes from, right? Perpetual, repetitive. If we walk in light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Now look at verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins. And Beloved, I don't know where you stand with God right now. Because your cover was blown a long time ago. You can put on in front of us, but you can't put on in front of him. He sees right through him. And if you do confess your sins to God, and you get to experience being a recipient of his love, a recipient of being known by God in a healthy way, 
the scripture says that his own love for us and that while we were still sinners guess what that means still sinners it means we didn't clean it up yet a lot of us think I'll go to God once I clean it up backwards you come to God and he cleans you babies don't wash themselves right they play in mud they go to the parent the parent says come here baby and he cleans the baby that's what happens but the kid doesn't wait until he's dirt free before he goes to mommy and daddy Baby comes as he is, mommy and daddy cleans him up. That that is you, because you are still a sinner, and yet Christ died for the likes of you. Which means you get to confess your sin to God, and you get to repent and turn from those sins. How much more then, since we have been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from wrath? I want you to be known by God in the same way that Nathaniel was known. That Jesus peered into Nathaniel's heart and he saw the substance. And Nathaniel's response to him is, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Guess what? When you don't confess your sins, it's hard to say that. You're harboring it. and It's hard to say those words with any genuineness. But beloved, if you take your time today to confess your sin and to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ that he'll take your sin and he'll wash you from your sin, you'll be able to hear in a unique way Jesus respond to you the same way he responded to Nathaniel. Jesus responded to him, do you believe I told you I saw you in the tree? You're going to see greater things than this. Then he said, truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened. And the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. What is this? You think the last statement was pregnant? This statement, nine months. How long does it take? Nine, ten months? Yeah, all the way, right? This statement is full of something else. How many of you guys have read this statement and just kept it moving? Not truly really knowing, don't raise your hand. Not truly really knowing what he's talking about. Yep, all of y'all. If y'all read it, y'all, oh, everybody's confused. I'm confused, you're confused, everybody's confused with this statement. This statement has a lot of meaning and it's a, we gotta try to unpack it though. Here's, again, two things. One of the things is I'm gonna pull that thing out your pocket, but not yet, keep it in there. One of the things Jesus is telling us is that none of us should be Do not what we would call supernatural experience that you had with a spiritual thing. Whether it be you had an encounter with God, some, some, some type of an encounter, or don't base your salvation on it. You casted out a demon, don't base your salvation on that. You were healed or you healed somebody, don't base your salvation on that. Jesus saw something. In Nathaniel, Nathaniel hears, oh my goodness, this is miraculous, the Messiah. And he's like, bro, that's all that it took? Or, but first, beloved, here's the warning not to. Not because I'm saying it's not enough. Scripture says it's not enough. Look at Matthew says, Matthew 7. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only one who does the will of my Father in heaven, which is repent and believe. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? That's what people in America would call supernatural. Did we drive out demons in your name? Supernatural. Did we do many miracles in your name? Supernatural. What's God's response? Then I will announce to them, I don't know you. Depart from me, lawbreakers. A supernatural experience isn't what you need in order to know that you know Jesus. Amen. You need God to reveal himself to you yes. in such a way where you will repent and believe on him. Yes. Despite the presence, lack thereof, or plenty of supernatural experience. Yes. Beloved, there's many of us who call ourselves believers because we were healed or we healed somebody and we think that we are his children. Beloved, that's not the proof. The proof isn't in a that we profess and believe 
that results in a sanctification that proves that we truly believe what we're professing. What is it that we need? We need God revealing himself to you, saving you from sin into a family and forming you into a new people. us to save us from our sin and not just from our sin but into a new family because he's forming a new people the greatest thing is he's making us into hear me now i don't know where you stand theologically but i stand here god is making all these multitudes of nations who have placed their faith in him into a new israel he's making a new people of god now here's where we're going Pastor Cain and I hear you saying that but where are you getting that from it seems like you strayed far away from the text now nah, B it's there we just don't know what it means remember the statement I told you to put in your pocket pull that bad boy out <laughs> how did the Israelites get their name Jacob. What does Jacob's name mean? Deceivers. Keep. Jesus responded to him, do you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than this. Then he said, truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Something like that before? That sound familiar at all? I think I read something like that in the Old Testament. I think I read it in the book of Genesis. I think there was an encounter that God Jacob. That Jesus, put your Hebrew mind on. Jesus is a look. Nathan hears him say that, and his mind goes instantly where? To Genesis. Look. The deceiver, Jacob, had an interaction with God as he was running from getting murked by his brother because he stole his brother's birthright. He's actively a deceiver, running from his deceit, the consequences of it. Jacob left Beersheba and he went toward Haran. He reached a certain place and spent the night there because the sun had set. He took one of the stones from that place and put it there as his, put it there at his head and laid down in that place and he dreamed. The stairway was set on the ground with its top reaching the sky. Here we go, y'all ready? Y'all ready? And God's angels were going up it and down it, ascending and descending based on your translation. And the Lord himself was standing there beside him saying, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your offspring the land on which you are laying. The deceiver is running and fleeing from his and he has an encounter with God. Keep going. Your offspring will be like the dust of the earth. And you will spread out toward the west and the east, the north and the south. All the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. That sounds like what he said to Abraham. No. We'll be blessed through you and your offspring. Look, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. That sounds like something that was said in the New Testament. Oh, God says connections. I'll watch you wherever you go. Where am I at? I got lost. Here we go. you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I've done what I promised you. God always keeps the promise. Verse 16, when Jacob awoke from his sleep, he said, surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. He was afraid, and he said, what an awesome place this is. This is the one other than, uh, I'm sorry, this is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Translation, this is Bethel, the house of God. Now remember those questions, right? Israelite, this dude, this deceiver who's running because his brother's getting ready to kill him because he has stolen his birthright. He's on the run. He's a criminal that escaped Alcatraz. 
And he, in, and he as an interaction with God, and in his vision, his interaction with God, what does he see? He sees angels ascending and descending, and the Lord standing by, telling him exactly who he is. I am the Lord, the God Almighty, the God of Abraham and Isaac, and I am your God as well. And through you, I'm going to bless every nation. That's what he's saying here. Deceiver. Well, Jesus takes this Old Testament, this Old Testament narrative and applies it to himself. Remember when we, we, we went through this a couple weeks back when the whole Bible talks about Jesus in one way, shape, or form? Bethel is the place, this is the place where the deceiver encounters God. Between heaven and earth was Yahweh's ladder. In your translation, it may say Jacob's ladder, but it's God's ladder. Well, Jesus, as he's revealing himself to Daniel, tells him that both Jacob and the ladder have been replaced by me, the son of man. He says, I'm going to reveal myself to you and through you, my disciples, all the nations will be blessed as I form in them a new Israel in whom there is no deceit because of my work upon the Jesus is now the place where men encounter God. And a true Israelite is one who is named after Jesus and not Jacob. Wow. He says, you believe because I saw that you're going to see something greater. Why? The whole nation is deceived. But I've come to open eyes. And through you, no deceit, no confusion, no treachery, only redemption because of me. Yeah. Angels ascending and descending. What? What's he bringing his mind to? The encounter that his descendant had with God. He wasn't good with God until here. Until he had an encounter with the Almighty. And then God goes on and he changes his name. He says, no longer will you be named Jacob. No, now that you've had an encounter with me, your name will be called Israel. A true Israelite. In whom there will be no deceit. You will no longer be a Jacob. God is making a new Israel. And Jesus is reminding us that he is the mediator between man and God. It is no longer a priest. It is no longer a history or a lineage. It is no longer a prophet. It is me. This is what the scripture says in 1 Timothy. Paul teaches this. But there is one God and one between God and mankind. The man Christ Jesus. You see, it's hard for us to see that unless we think with their lenses. As soon as he is Doing to my ancestor Jacob and revealing himself to him. Whoa. Now he's saying, Whoa, now I see who you are. Now his statement carries all the more weight. You truly are the Messiah, the Son of God, the King of Israel. I know who you are now. And I know what you need. And what you need is me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to reveal myself to you. These are these greater things. Not the miracle. Not the, not the supernatural knowledge. I want to show myself to you. That's greater things. In fact, beloved, in the, in the ending of the book of John, Jesus tells his disciples, y'all think I did miraculous works? You're going to do greater things. And our human mind automatically thinks, well, Jesus was healing people and bringing people back from the, that means we're going to be able to do supernatural things. No, but that's not the greater things he's talking about. Because no apostle in Acts ever has than Jesus ever did. So it can't be that that he's talking about. But what he's talking about is through their ministry, you will see within the first evangelistic uh, uh, attempt of Peter, he never saw that. One of the greatest things you're going to see, more people will encounter the redemption in my name than we'll ever see because that you're willing to open your mouth and show them who I am. Bump the miracles. I need the revelation. Jesus goes to Nathaniel and he says, I know you and I'm going to reveal myself to you and I know what you need. And God is saying a similar thing to us. He says, beloved, I know you and I know what you need and you don't need the thing you think you need. 
You need the job, you need the money, you need the car, you need the house, you need the status, you need the career, you need the promotion. You, need, you just need your spouse to get it together. You just need your kids to act right, stop beating up other kids in school. What's the thing you think you need? Jesus is like, nah, it ain't that stuff. Greater things. You need me. Everything comparison to me. Once you know me, everything else falls where it needs to. You will, go, you will represent the kingdom in an amazing way. Not because you have the gift of healing or miracle. No, beloved, because you know me and through your lips, others will know me. That's the greater things. The multiplication and the spread of the dominion of the spirit of God and the power of Christ. Yes. So he goes to Nathaniel and he's like, beloved, I know you and I know what you need and greater things are coming. He says, I'm going to provide a means of forgiveness and salvation for you. But only if you turn from your sin and entrust yourself to me. Nathaniel was lost as an Israelite with no deceit before he met Jesus. He meets Jesus and all of a sudden he's found and he fulfills Jesus' words. Now, in whom there is no deceit. Beloved, my hope and prayer this morning is that we would uh, stop hiding who we are before God, that we would take the time to get quiet before him. We would ask us of our sin, and wherever that takes you, it takes you. But ask him to root that out and to draw you closer to him, because that's what you need. Everything else is good. But you, need, you need proximity to Jesus. And that's why our whole thing is leading people closer to Jesus first. Everything else is, comes after that. Be known by Jesus, be loved by Jesus, and be made into a new people by Jesus. Take the, take the risk and put your heart in it. Let's see what he does. He says, a bruised reed. Translation, he's safe. Father.